Ladies and gentlemen, National Vice President and Executive Division Coordinator Shelly Sherman. Good afternoon. It is my great privilege to welcome you to the session on Israel and the Middle East, which really goes to the core of everything that we in Hadassah care about and work for. When we first framed this session, Israel was, of course, not yet engaged in Operation Protective Edge. And so now the questions that we originally posed have a very different feel and in many ways have become more timely. What's going on inside Israel today? What about in the neighborhoods surrounding it? And what does the future hold? Our distinguished panel will explore these and other issues over the next hour and a half. And it is my pleasure to introduce our panel. Ari Shavit, journalist Tara Aretz, author of My Promised Land. <laughs> Brett Lewis Stevens, Pulitzer Prize winner, foreign affairs correspondent, and deputy editorial page editor for the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> and moderating today will be our moderator and commentator, Gil Troy, professor of history at McGill University in Montreal, and, re our Canadians, and research fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute's Engaging Israel program in Jerusalem. And my favorite part, a young Judea alum. The, full the speaker's full bios are in your program book, and I urge you to read them as they are very impressive. And now we'll begin. Thank you, Shelley. Good afternoon, Hadassah. What a thrill it is to be home. Because wherever you gather, I feel at home. As a former young Judean and as a current young Judean, because you're never ending your relationship. I know how much you've given to me and my friends and to the world. I also am a Recovering Hadassah patient. I can do this only because of the Hadassah Medical Organization. Because I jogged myself, I jogged myself into a broken femur, and two operations later, after only costing 800 shekels, I can now stand. So I want to thank you, and my mother thanks you. I wish that this afternoon would just be a celebration. But of course, we're all mourning. We're all worried. We're all nervous. We're all looking for answers. We get so much inspiration from Israel, even during these difficult moments. Do you know that last night there was a mass funeral? Over 20,000 people showed up for a lone soldier, a Chayal Boded, who was killed in Gaza. And Maccabi Haifa, the soccer team, which knew that he was a fan, put out on their Facebook page, please show up to the funeral, it will be a big mitzvah. So here you have the soccer team using the phrase mitzvah in this Jewish state, and over 20,000 people came to show there's no such thing as a lone soldier in Israel. We're all united. And thanks to the good work that you do, we know that there will be both Israelis and Arabs healed thanks to the magic of Hadassah Medical Organization. So keep doing what you're doing. And today, we're not just going to learn, we're going to brainstorm. We're going to try to learn from these two extraordinary minds, not just about what's happening in the Middle East, but how do we internalize it? And how do we, even during these difficult days, continue to love Israel, defend Israel, celebrate Israel, and dream. So without further ado, I'd like to call Ari Shavit to give us some thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a real honor and privilege to be here. Uh, but it's not only an honor and privilege. It was really difficult for me to come here today. When I left home a few days ago, we were hoping it won't get that bad, 
but it already seemed quite problematic. And yet I felt that not only do I have to meet my commitment to Hadassah, but that it is especially important in these days to be with you here, because as I'll say at the end of my short speech, the front, the American Jewish front, the battle in this land of this community is almost as important as the one we are conducting at these moments in the Gaza Strip. So after I finish, I will rush to my hotel and get on the plane because I managed to secure this morning the last seat on an Al Al flight going home. But I'm so happy to be here because of that commitment I mentioned and because of my deep feeling about your organization. My great-grandfather, Hillel Yoffe, one of the first doctors in Israel, in Palestine at the time, worked with Hadassah in the 1920s. And then my uncles, who were doctors, worked with Hadassah throughout the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. Although I know it's difficult days these days to Hadassah in Jerusalem, I still think that what you established there is the most amazing institution there is. As a Jerusalemite, before I left Jerusalem a few years ago because of personal reasons, I was always proud of what we call the Jerusalem medicine, which is actually the Hadassah medicine that is so different than the Tel Aviv medicine. <laughs> so you should really be proud of yourselves, even when times are difficult. Two weeks ago, to the day, I realized where it was about to go. So I went into the nursery of my sons, my 10-year-old Michael and my 5-year-old Danielle. And I told them that in the coming days, they might hear something they never heard before, the howling sound of sirens. A day later, by evening, they did hear for the first time the howling sound of sirens. I thought about my previous sirens. When I was a boy, one of my first memories, I was three or four, is my mother reading to my older brother Anna Frank's diary. I didn't get it. I didn't understand the Holocaust. All I took from it was her description of the frightening sound of sirens outside. But then in 1967, when I was nine, I heard my first sirens. People forget what it was like, but in the days before the Six Day War, we feared we might face extinction. And when we rushed to the neighbor's shelter in the early morning hours of June 5th, we did not know what the future holds. And when we heard the sounds of bombs 10 miles from where we live, where I live, it was scary. Only when we got out of the shelter did we realize that we destroyed Egypt's, Syria's, and Jordan's air forces, and we were saved. But only six years later, there was another siren. I lived in Rehovot, under the Tel right next to the Tel Nof Air Base, and I'll never forget the sound of the sirens howling at the noon, late noon of Yom Kippur with the phantom planes going just over our rooftops. But contrary to 67, many of them did not return. 
Israel nearly collapsed. If it wasn't for the great courage of our soldiers and, to, and the support of the United States, God knows what would have happened. My fourth siren was in 1991. Nothing horrible really happened in Israel. But when Saddam Hussein sent his Scud missiles, we feared there might be chemical weapons in them. And again, I'll never forget going down to my elderly neighbors who were Holocaust survivors, who then immigrated to Florida, but decided to make Aliyah late in their lives. And the sight of the two elderly men and women that I had to put gas masks on their face, thinking of what they've been through, thinking of Jewish fate. How is it that people that have been through the worst have even to experience that kind of fear? So when I was watching my boys, hearing their first sirens, when Michael asked whether a missile will hit our home and destroy it, and when Daniel asked whether Sorry about that, that usually doesn't happen to me. When Daniel asked whether Iron Dome might break, my heart was broken. Because there was no real danger. Their fears had no real reason right now. But they too joined the tragic rituals of Israel's tragic condition. I was, when we went out of the shelter, again, everything was calm all around. There was no real threat. But I realized that something very deep has happened. Because this, these years, quiet years, when we were not exposed to real violence, were gone. And the bubble that in many ways we lived in was not there anymore. So let me say what I think has happened. First of all, we must get the moral record straight. We are facing an attack by a religious fascist organization. Hamas is not only after us. Hamas does not respect the rights of women of Christians, of gays, of individuals. It's an evil organization, and we should never forget that. But beyond that, Hamas has attacked us after we pulled out of Gaza. We did exactly what the world has expected us to do. No settlements, no checkpoints, no occupation army. And yet they did not turn their Gaza Strip, which is the first free, so to speak, Palestinian piece of land they ever had. They did not turn it into a Singapore, but taken, turned it into a hating basis, shooting rockets at Israel. But beyond that, Israel was so restrained as we were going to this crisis, but Hamas insisted on provoking us. And what is the target? What is the target of the evil Hamas? On the one hand, it is to kill Israelis. I'm so angry at the fact that we do not have a proper PR machine. Because if we would have had a PR machine, it would have said every day how many Israelis would have been killed today if it wasn't for Iron Dome. <laughs> but Hamas is doing something more, even more evil. Their real target is to have their own people killed. They want us killed, but they want their own people to get killed. And in this sense, they are different and worse than almost any other entity we know. Because wars are brutal, and people do brutal things in war. 
But they attempt, it's not only that they use their population as a, as a human shield. The purpose, the strategy of Hamas is based on the attempt of killing their own people. And that makes them something that really should be outside, totally outside the human scope of what we are willing to accept. So those who criticize Israel today, and I'm, I know Israel is making mistakes, and I'm the first one to admit them. But those who criticize Israel today, is there anyone in this room who has doubt what America would have done if Al-Qaeda would have taken control over Guantanamo and shot rockets, first at Miami, and then at Charleston, and then at Atlantic City, and then at Washington in New York. No people getting killed, but the sirens howl in New York and Washington three, four times a day. What would Obama's America do? What would the most, most liberal Democrats support? There's no question at all of the need of Israel to react to this terrible challenge. And yet, I want to be sincere with you and tell you what it looks like. Israel did very well on defense. First of all, Iron Dome. One cannot overstate the importance and the virtuous Iron Dome. I think that the engineers of Iron Dome should actually get the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize. I think it might be an idea for President Obama to give them his, actually. <laughs> now, this is only half a joke, because because of them, dozens and hundreds of Israelis were saved, and because of them, we didn't have to conquer Gaza and having hundreds of soldiers killed and thousands of Palestinians killed. So Israel was great there. The other Israel virtue was Israel's civic society that proved to be so resilient and impressive once again. But the problem, as I'm committed to be sincere, is that we see that on the offense, we did not find an elegant, clear solution to what we call asymmetric warfare. And the reason we are in deep mud right now, facing a difficult challenge, is that because although Hamas is evil, Hamas has been rather impressive as a terrorist organization and it developed a sophisticated strategy, and it is seriously challenging us. So while Israel has so many achievements in internal unity, relative international support, and again, the behavior of the people, and the courage of our soldiers, we are facing a dilemma. Because if we go for a ceasefire now, there are two consequences. One, the next round with Hamas will be close and more difficult. We'll have real problems with Hamas in coming years, and possibly even months. But the other, all the bad guys in the Middle East are watching. Hezbollah and Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Jihad and all the others. If we do not come with a real achievement, a dramatic achievement, facing this provocation, we will face greater challenges in the future. But the other side of the dilemma is that if there is no sophisticated solution, military solution soon, we'll get bogged down into an even increasing situation where our boys are endangered, and when we have to rescue them, we do what we did two days ago in Sajaya, which is to use a lot of firepower and bring a real jeopardize our international legitimacy. So it's a really, really difficult one. In general terms, I really think that the solution should be a Syrian-like solution. 
a total demilitarization of the Gaza Strip while willing to give the population of Gaza some economic help and relief so they can have a life as long as they don't have rockets. I ran out of time before I really began talking about the larger Israeli condition that I hope we'll discuss. But let me say the following. When I wrote my book, I asked myself three questions that I think are the important Israel questions. Why Israel? What's Israel? And will Israel? Why Israel? Because there is a need. There is a moral imperative to have a home for the homeless people. What's Israel? It's a remarkable, astounding, unprecedented phenomenon of vitality against all odds. Will Israel? That depends on us, and I hope we'll discuss it now. That depends on Israel turning the amazing energy and vitality it has in order to have a better public policy, better government, better leadership, and handling our way today as the founding fathers and of mothers of Zionism did 70 and 50 and 100 years ago. They were so wise, they combined idealism and patriotism with realism and sophistication. They almost always saw to that that we'll have a strong alliance with the greater powers, and they saw to that that we'll always have the upper moral, grind, moral grind, uh, ground, high ground. They were so impressive, and they created the miracle called Israel which is the most astounding man-made miracle one can imagine. So what we have to do is basically two things. Reform Israel, go back to the old wisdom of Zionism, and at the same time, what goes with it, go on a major Zionist offensive in this country. Because the other great battle we face while we fight with all these villains of the Middle East, is here. We must find a sophisticated way to reach out to progressive America and win its heart again. We, we must reach out, which is the most important of all, to your children and your grandchildren. The battle for the minds of hearts of young American Jews is the most important one of the day. If we will lose them, we will have no hope. Not we in Israel and you, not you in this great American Jewish community. So in my mind, once we deal with the immediate problem of Gaza, and while we deal with the strategic problems facing Israel, Iran, and the Arab chaos and all that impossible environment we live in. At the very same time, we have to launch this new offensive. Only the renewal of an energized, new, redefined Zionism can give a future and hope to us in Israel and to you in North America. Thank you very much. such an honor to be here. Um, a little more than 10 years ago, my first child was born at Hadassah and Karim Hospital. And when the nurse first held uh, Lara Shoshana in uh, her arms, a Russian nurse, she said, ah, long legs, she'd be ballerina. <laughs> and the nurse was right. I have the tallest daughter in her class, and she's a ballerina. Um, so I'm very honored, I'm delighted to be here. 
This is an organization that not only represents the history of Zionism, but also the future of Zionism. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the broader picture. I'm the foreign affairs columnist of uh, the Wall Street uh, Journal. I'm coming out with a book on um, America and its role in the world uh, going forward. And that matters to what is happening today in Israel. It matters to the shape uh, of the Middle East. And it matters to the future of the Jewish people, both in Israel and in the diaspora. And in my view, there are three great trends taking place today. And I want to just spend a few minutes talking about each one of them. First, at the broadest level, is what I call the post Pax Americana world. Now, you might remember that a few years ago, Fareed Zakaria wrote a book called The Post-American World, uh, which argued that uh, in the 21st century, the great powers of the world would be not just the United States, but also the Chinese, also the Indians, also the Brazilians, and many other countries that were, in his view, the rising countries. Well, if any of you saw what happened to uh, Brazil in the semifinal of the World Cup, <laughs> you are reminded of the aphorism that Brazil is the country of the future and always will be. <laughs> and so it goes with many of the other challengers. The United States still is and will remain the preeminent economy, preeminent global power in the world, no matter what it is we do for the rest of this century and all happily make bets on that prediction. But we are entering a world called what I call the post Pax Americana world. We have to remember that there were two great foreign policy events for the United States in the 20th century. One happened in 1919 and 1920, when in the wake of the First World War, Americans decided that the rest of the world was cruel, duplicitous, difficult, and we wanted to have nothing to do with it. And so what we got was the foreign policy on a wholly bipartisan basis of uh, the isolationists, of Calvin Coolidge and Warren Harding, and truth be told, the first several years of the Franklin Roosevelt administration until FDR started waking up to what was happening in Germany. America withdrew from the world, and as a result, we had global catastrophe because the liberal powers of the day, the liberal democratic powers of the day, either lacked the means or lacked the will to police a decent world order. So suddenly, the fascists in Italy, the communists in Moscow, the Nazis in Berlin, the, fa the, the militarists in Tokyo realized that there was no world policeman, realized that they could invade Manchuria and Abyssinia and Czechoslovakia at will, and that's how we came upon the catastrophe of the Second World War. Then, after the Second World War, we had a great debate in this country, and it pitted statesmen like Robert, uh, uh, like Robert Taft on the right and Henry Wallace on the left against other statesmen like Harry Truman and Dean Acheson and Arthur Vandenberg. And in that great debate, which took place in the early days after the war in 1946 and 1947, Truman and Acheson um, and Vandenberg won. And we had 70 years of the most peaceful and prosperous, uh, or seven decades of, of general peace and prosperity in the world, unmatched in human history. None of us has really known, except those of us in the room who are quite old, none of us has ever known a world entirely at war. This is the world of Pax Americana, and it has been a good world. It is also the only world, the only world order that Israel has ever known. Now we see in America that as in the years after the First World War is disillusioned with the world, is sick of fighting foreign wars, wants to have less of a foreign policy, asks, as a previous generation once asked, why die for Danzig, is now asking, why die for Doha? Or indeed, perhaps, why die for Tel Aviv? This is the way American foreign policy is going. And so we are entering this world in which rogue states are beginning to get the sense that nobody is in charge, that if Mr. Putin invades Ukraine, there will be no consequences. And if Mr. Assad gasses his own people, there will be no consequences. And perhaps the lesson will be drawn in China, 
that if they invade Taiwan or attempt wars in their neighborhood, there will also be no consequences. And the Iranians are certainly taking the lesson that they can march right up into a nuclear bomb and face no serious consequences from the United States. That's the calculation that's driving them. And so we are entering a new global disorder, a global disorder that most of us in this room have never known, and a global disorder that Israel has never known. Because despite all the dangers of the past, despite what happened in 67 and 73 and 91, up until the present, Israel has always been consoled by the thought that when the chips are down, the United States is there to guarantee its security. I'm not sure that's true anymore. I think that idea may have died when we refused to impose consequences on Bashar Assad for using chemical weapons to murder 1,000 people in Damascus. So that's the first point. The second point, I fear, is what I call the moral collapse of the West. Just the other day, two or three days ago, I was watching a YouTube video of a protest in Germany mostly Palestinians or, 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 or Turks or Arabs, and what were they chanting? Jews, Jews to the gas. This was a protest happening on Alexanderplatz in Berlin. This is happening in Paris, where Jews cannot go to their shuls without fear of mobs going after them. This is happening in one capital after another in Europe. And I'm sorry to say, that Europeans, especially those Europeans of the left who've so freely been condemning Israel all these years, are discovering a little too late the intrinsic connection between quote-unquote anti-Zionism of the new kind and anti-Semitism of the old kind. And the common denominator is hatred and demonization of the Jews, whether it's Jews as a nation state or Jews as a race or Jews as a religion. That's the common denominator. So when we hear from Mr. Hollande um, how unacceptable this is. What is really unacceptable is decades of European policy to isolate Israel, to demonize the settlers, to treat Israel as a de facto pariah state, to treat Israel as the only nation in the world that is expected to behave like a Christian country. <laughs> this is not just a collapse that's happening in Europe or in diplomatic circles. It's a collapse, I'm afraid to say, that is also happening in the media. I don't know how many times I have read the story from my media colleagues that Gaza is the most packed, densely populated place on Earth. Excuse me, but this is, as, as a colleague of mine likes to say, this is an argument that vanishes in the presence of thought. Do you know that downtown, do you know that downtown Tel Aviv has a greater population density than Gaza? Do you know that the population density of Hong Kong is four times greater than Gaza? So what are we talking about? If you don't believe me, go to Google Satellite and look at Gaza. Much of it is empty. Why are my colleagues constantly going on about the horrendously densely populated conditions of Gaza, the unique tragedy of Gaza? Have any of them ever spent a day or a week as I have in northern Egypt, in the region between Cairo and, uh, and Alexandria, and looked at conditions there. Is Gaza so uniquely <coughs> deprived? Is it a situation where a Holocaust is taking place? On the contrary. And why hasn't the media asked itself just how much money is being spent to build hundreds of tunnels, whether into Egypt or into Israel? I would like to see the economic analysis from my friends who go on and on in, on, uh, uh, in the media about how Israel is depriving the Palestinians of this or, that, um, <coughs> this or that economic need. How much of that has gone into an economy based not on greenhouses, on agriculture, on services, but on an economy based on rockets and mortars and tunnels and training for guerrillas? Gaza could have been a showcase in the best sense for what a Palestinian state might have been. It could have demonstrated not only to Israelis but to the whole world what a free Palestine might look like. But it did demonstrate what a free Palestine might look like. It's a place where you can no longer land a plane in Tel Aviv 
for fear of rockets. That's an outrage. And it's an outrage that the media has not done its job in showing what happened up until this point. <coughs> and let me make another point. You know, I'm, I'm a columnist with the Wall Street Journal, which is often said to be a conservative editorial page. But I believe in the rights of women. I believe, I believe that governments should leave their countries a little greener than they found them. I believe that gay people should be able to have, thank you. I believe in Jewish mothers who are as nice as my own. I believe that gay people should be able to serve their country. I believe that journalists should be able to speak truth to power freely. I believe that if a, if a prominent politician, let us say a prime minister or a former prime minister or a president, has committed a crime, that they should be accountable for those crimes. I believe that when I say these things, this is the core of liberalism. This is the core of what should be progressive thought. So where are my fellow progressives? Why are they so often found condemning the one state in the region that actually holds dear and defends and upholds and protects and enlarges the very values they claim to believe in? Why are they fellow traveling, as Ari said, with this fascistic, Islamist, totalitarian movement? Never mind what it's doing with Israel. Look at what Hamas does with women in the Palestinian Authority. Look at, the look, at, look at the treatment of gay people in the Palestinian Authority. Look at the, 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 the treatment of journalists who dissent from the orthodoxy in the Palestinian Authority. The only decent and honorable liberalism, for whatever <coughs> this or that criticism you may have of Israel, the only decent or honorable liberalism is pro-Israel liberalism. Because to be anti-Israel and to call yourself a liberal is to be either a fool or a hypocrite. It's to fellow travel with totalitarians. <laughs> the third point is the challenge to the Jews. And this is a more profound and more difficult point. You know, maybe it is the result of 2,000 years of statelessness that the Jews didn't quite get the memo on what the requirements of building a state are often like. We happen to be, I happen to be talking in a city, you didn't mention, uh, I, was, I grew up in Mexico City, in a city I like to call Las Vegas. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, how many people in this room know what Vegas means? Does anyone? Meadow, Meadow right. Que bueno. Viva Mexico. I'm sorry, but we are in occupied territory right now. I just want to remind everyone in this room of this fact. <laughs> For too long, Israelis, and I want to say American Jews too, have operated on the assumption that if you take risks for peace, if you show that you're willing to make concessions, Concessions will be made in return. We're now 21 years after the signing of the Oslo Peace Accord. And what we find is that Israel, after withdrawing from more territory proportionally <coughs> than any other state that I know of in this world, more than any other state, finds itself more isolated and more condemned for the concessions and the risks it has taken for peace. We're told that if we're told that if you show that you're willing to take those concessions, even if you aren't rewarded by the Palestinians, by your enemies, you will be rewarded in the court of public opinion. But have we been rewarded in the court of public opinion? No, we're more detested in the court of public opinion. We're told, and it is a personal virtue, before you start cast, pointing fingers at the other guy, think of your own behavior. It's a wonderful thing to do. But beware, beware that enemies of Israel like nothing more than to find Israelis or Jews who they can say, ah, even that Israeli, even that Jewish American condemns this or that about Israel. Beware of that. 
We think that we're being funny. We think that we're being cool by, this, by piling on. You know, I remember after the Mavi Marmara incident where 10, uh, uh, those 10 uh, Turkish extremists were, were, were killed, there was this mountain of criticism, not only among the Turks and Israel haters, but among Israelis and Jews themselves. You know, why couldn't Israel have performed a flawless operation by sending frogmen to disable the rotor and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, another Entebbe-like miracle. And I realized that there's a problem that we have in this world. You know, I'm sure in college some of you took a pass-fail class, and in pass-fail, you know, if you get above a D, you pass. Well, with Israelis and Jews, we're taking a pass-fail course but the pass rate is you have to get an A or you're a failure. This is dangerous because Israel is a state composed of mortal human beings who sometimes make mistakes. And if we constantly hold ourselves to an impossible standard, we will be failing not only in the eyes of the world, but failing in our own eyes. Whereas look at the Palestinians. Look at the Iranians. What's their pass-fail score? One? Zero? When you expect everything of someone, you forgive them nothing. And when you expect nothing of someone, you forgive them everything. And we have to get away from that toxic equation. So I know I too have run out of time, but I want to make three brief points. What do we need to do in the world? Number one, we have to get away from this toxic idea that somehow when the United States engages in the world, when we are strong, when we act to stop massacres, when we act to police dangerous waters, whether it's in South China Sea or the Persian Gulf, <coughs> we are somehow depriving ourselves of things we might be giving ourselves at home. Because the insight of people like Harry Truman and Dean Acheson was that America's prosperity depended on America's security. And the best way to secure America is a world in which a great liberal power polices a decent and humane order. Foreign policy and domestic policy are not a zero-sum game. They are complementary. When America is strong abroad, it will be strong at home as well. The second point is to have a pedagogy, just as Ari was saying, with our young people, to explain to them that when you're supporting Israel, you're not just supporting the Jewish people, although you are supporting the Jewish people. You're not just supporting a democracy, although you are supporting a democracy. You are supporting civilization and liberal civilization against its bar most barbaric enemies. And in that struggle, you have to take sides. And finally, I want to make, uh, this is, I think, maybe the point I want to, uh, I'll, I'll end with. You know, you ask why, Ari asked, why is, why is um, uh, Israeli public diplomacy so lousy? And, and why are the Palestinians, by the way, so effective? It's because the Palestinians never apologize. <coughs> My lord, Achille Loro. No apologies. Hamas, rockets, no apologies. It's not perhaps a commendable strategy on a moral level, but it's very effective as public relations. Israelis and Jews can't stop apologizing. We apologize for things we didn't do. <laughs> we have to remind ourselves that the purpose of the state of Israel is to turn the chosen people into a choosing people. We have to remind ourselves that the purpose of the state of Israel is not to showcase Israeli victimization. It is to end Israeli victimization. <laughs> One last scene. People say, you know, what are we going to do? We have all these problems. There's a wonderful little scene in, um, what was that? It was based, this Russell Crowe movie based on the Master and Commander uh, 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 series. And there's a scene where they're going into a storm, and a sailor has to go up the main mast to secure the sail. And you see a scene of his fingers, and tattooed on his fingers are the letters H-O-L-D-F-A-S-T. Hold fast. That's what we've been doing for 67, 68 years, and we've been thriving. Keep at it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody gave you a sucking candy over there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to you both for such passionate and insightful speeches. But I'm sitting here listening, and, and I'm getting kind of vertigo. 
I'm getting this feeling of we see things so clearly, and you both spoke about a kind of a moral gap between the world that we see and the world that's out there. First of all, what went wrong? Why is there this gap? Ari, could you start with what's, what, what's the missing piece? Well, I, although I, I totally agree with, with, with almost all that, that was said here, <laughs> I, I, want, I, I want us to try, I, I think it's very important to be sincere and courageous in analyzing the problem and dealing with it. If we only live in our closed, sheltered world, and we just tell ourselves how great we are and how anti-Semitic all the others are, we don't understand the problem. There is, I'm an Israeli-born Sabra, but as I like to say, I have a long Jewish nose and I can smell anti-Semitism. <laughs> I know there is a lot of that around. But I, I urge us to be more courageous in analyzing the problem, and I'll begin by trying to be bipartisan. It's true, I come from the left. The left in my country, a lot of them hate me more than they hate the right. <laughs> because I came and challenged their dogmas. But there were some dogmas on the right as well. So I think that because we are in a bad position, let's look at what has happened. And it's true that political correctness has become a poison for minds and in intelligentsia and media in the West and in Israel and in America. Basically, what's the problem in my mind? It's not us. The problem is that there isn't the ability to call a spade a spade when it comes to third world evil. And we are the victims. That's the problem on the left. But the reason America is today where it is, with your correct analysis, is that America spent all its resources and energy on a war that went bad. And it wasn't led by progressives and liberal Democrats. We are all today suffering for what I call a horrific spelling mistake. <laughs> After 9-11, America had to assert its power as an empire. The right way to do it was to deal with Iran. It did not call for a war, but if America would have led an economic political siege in Iran in 2003, 2005, 2007, we would have dealt with the most dramatic problem facing us, which I'll say something about. But America went to Iraq. There was a mistake there, and we are all suffering, definitely you in this country, but the entire West from the fatigue and isolation is dangerous isolation that is caused by that. If you don't have the right idea and you take all the best intentions, I, I, I'm sure the intention, by the way, I think that the, the neocons got it right regarding analyzing the problems of, of the Middle East, of my region. They were more courageous in this sense. But the solution was a very simplistic one and it didn't work. So today we are all suffering from this fatigue that helps our enemies, everywhere. So I'm, now I'm not into having debates about Iraq, definitely it's not for me as an Israeli. I'm into, let's try to be, let each one be honest about his mistakes. And let's, rather than be, you know, your politics in America here is not that great anymore because it's so polarized. Our politics is definitely not great. Let's try to move on. Let's, let's try to have a more complex, a more, in my mind, sincere and courageous attitude and see that there were many mistakes done by conservatives and liberals, by Democrats and Republicans, by Americans and Israelis. We all made mistakes. And let's now look at the challenge. And let me state what the challenge is. The most dramatic, with all due respect to what we experience now, which is very, very dramatic, 
because it's not only Hamas. The new challenge facing us is the Arab chaos. Israel was lucky and, and smart in the first three, three and a half years of the Arab chaos to prevent him from hitting us. Now we see that this is at our doorstep. And Hamas is only the beginning. So we have to deal with it. But the really big one, the really big one is Iran. We wasted all the energy on the different, and again, everybody made mistakes. I, I'm, I'm not, so let's, rather than look back into the past, let's look at the future. If we, we are talking about critical months now, or another four months, if Iran will go nuclear, the Middle East will go nuclear, if the Middle East go nuclear, life will change not only in Tel Aviv, it will change even in Las Vegas. Iran, in my mind, is a challenge to our civilization. A nuclear Iran will challenge our civilization. But Iran is also a civilization failure because we all failed to deal with it in the right way at the right time. And God forbid it might be too late, too late. I hope it's not too late, but it's the last moments. So we have to focus and get, now the way to deal with this is to get to reach out also to the people on the left. If Israel just counts on the support of half the Republican party, it's doomed. It's doomed, we have to enlarge, we need a big tent in the Jewish community, we did a big tent in the Jewish world, and we need a big tent in the West. So although the Europeans are so bad, and I agree, when you talk sensibly, by the way, on Iran, France and, and Britain, for instance, are much better than the United States. So, so there are major problems, but let's bring a new attitude now, and the main reason is that if we just stick to an overprotected, old-fashioned way of loving Israel, we will not reach the progressives and we will not reach the young. Look, I've been around American campuses. There are very, very few conservative students out there. Look at your own families. 90% of young American Jews are Obama voters. If we do not find a way to make Israel attractive for them, if we do not find a way to reach out for them with their own terms, if we don't prove to them that we are just, that we are the people that were the ultimate victims of the West, and we saved ourselves, and that's admirable, but we made mistakes, and we do make mistakes, and we are not a marble statue, if we only would develop a new sincere attitude, we'll be able to save them for Judaism, to save them for Israel, and to really to give us a new start. Thank you. Right, isn't that the meal culpa you were talking about? Um, well, to return the favor to Ari, I agree with much of what he said. <laughs> uh, all of it is, is provocative and, and intelligent, and I agree with much of it. Uh, let me make um, uh, just, a, just a few points. Um, there is a view out there that Israel is becoming uh, unpopular among young American Jews. And a few years ago, Peter Beinart wrote this um, uh, magazine article, which then turned into a book, uh, 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 which um, uh, it, it was an interesting thing because he wrote this magazine article, the thesis of which was young American Jews are turning away from Israel because Israel is Likud, Israel is occupation, Israel is apartheid state, et cetera, et cetera. And then a few months later, there was a very interesting survey that came out of Brandeis University um, that looked at the attitudes of American Jews uh, toward Israel. And as I, as I joked in a review of Peter's book, that study was to Peter's thesis what um, the fat man was to uh, Hiroshima. Um, uh, it was a, a complete devastation of it because what it found was that, in fact, American Jewish sympathies toward Israel have remained remarkably strong, and that what, you hap what, what happens is that what he calls a life cycle, which in which you know, a young, say, let's say a young American boy goes and has his bar mitzvah in Jerusalem, he's filled with pro-Zionism, then in college he doesn't really care. Why? Because he's focused on what matters most in life, which is girls, right? Um, and then later on he focuses on what matters second in life, which is money. Uh, 
But then he gets a little older and he has the girl and he has some money and then he starts to understand that there are other things that matter and what you find is um, very powerful sort of return to uh, a kind of a pro-Israel view. And what's interesting is that a lot of Americans who might be Obama voters or Democrats or liberals, nonetheless, in terms of their views of Israel, are very, very mainstream. They are not sort of wandering off into the kind of, into the, the land of Peter and, and other people. So um, I think that's, that's, uh, that's good news. We, we don't want to, we have lots of crises that doesn't happen to be uh, perhaps foremo uh, the foremost one. One thing we ought to be doing, however, is we need to start expanding the ambit of pro-Israel activism. You know, I find myself all the time debating people on campuses like Columbia on, you know, the Israel question. Why am I at Columbia? Why am I at an elite university uh, where students are being educated by the disciples of Edward Said? Why am I not at the University of Nebraska, or University of Oklahoma, flyover country America? And the reason I ask that is because the United States, and by the way, there was just a study today, Americans are overwhelmingly pro-Israel in the conflict with, um, uh, with Hamas. Um, Americans just kind of get it. You know, they might not know who Lieberman is, and they might not know the names and where Gaza is exactly, but they kind of say those Israelis are kind of like us, and those Hamas types are kind of like Al-Qaeda. You know, and, and wouldn't it be a bit of a chutzpah if Netanyahu were to send Lieberman to Washington to insist on a ceasefire between uh, the United States and Al-Qaeda? Actually, it'd be delightful if something like that happened, just for uh, a comic value. But the reason I mention this is that we are not doing it. What the critical, the missing piece is that we are not doing enough to reach out to the philo-Semitic world. Believe it or not, there are all these people, and either fly, and they're not just evangelical Christians, although many of them are evangelical Christians, but there are people all over America, and there are people, in fact, all over the world who mysteriously like, admire, respect the Jews. And one of the funniest stories I heard in the last few years is that South Korea was sending Ministry of Education officials to study uh, Israeli schools because they thought, well, where's all this Israeli ingenuity coming from? And little did they know, Israeli schools are disgraced to, you know, in spite of schools. It's in spite of schools, right? Um, but, it, but, but it indicated the sense that, ah, here's a little country that's doing something amazing. A few years ago, I was at a synagogue in Cleveland, and I was approached, it was a classic synagogue audience, sort of you know, middle-aged or older people. Young Chinese woman from Shanghai comes up to me, said, what are you doing here? And she said, ah, we Chinese people know, Jewish people, smartest in the world. And I was almost, I didn't want to say it. Well, yeah, you know, it happens to be true. So I, I said, oh, come on, you know. Um, please, don't, don't, you know, don't say that. And she said, no. Nobel Prize in chemistry, 42% Jewish, you know. And uh, I mean, she went to, so she knew all these statistics. I, I don't know, I don't remember what the numbers were, but they're impressive. <coughs> and what she was essentially saying is, you Jews are fantastic. Celebrate it. And by the way, there, she, she kept insisting there are millions of us Chinese who think just like you do. So what would happen if someone were to set up um, uh, 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 an Israel center in Shanghai, make it non-political, bring in agronomists, bring in economists, bring in archaeologists, talk to the Chinese. In 30 years, the people, the Chinese who are going to the Israel Institute are going to be leading that country. And we're going to be making new friends in a post-Pax Americana world. So there, there's a lot that, that, that we can do without thinking, oh, you know, heavens, we're losing the, those, those Columbia University undergrads who, as a University of Chicago alumnus, I have to say, those Columbia guys have been overrated <laughs> for decades. Matt, Matt yeah. I, I, I really love the conversation because I think this is really deep and important and, and relevant to us. It's not something that we are just... And, and, and let me tell you, Brett, I... I really pray you're right. I pray, I, I'm, I'll be so happy to be proven wrong on that one. I actually urge really each one in the room to go and do a poll with their grandchildren, okay? Children and grandchildren. I can tell you that I was in a very respectable uh, hall with 150 youngsters where we had exactly the same debate. There was a very impressive American Jewish leader whom I love deeply, and he said basically what you said, that I'm exaggerating. So I told him, let's take a vote. There were 150 people, 25 year old, more or less. 130 said I was right, and 20 said he was right. 
Now, I hope you're right. Let me ask but, you, but, but let me ask but, you, are but, your politics what they were when you were 25? No, 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 but that's not the point. That's the point. I, that, that your point about the cycle of life, perhaps. But, but, let, let me tell me a bit about my experiences. I, I went around dozens of, of universities. And what I asked the young people is, is it cool to be pro-Israel? Hardly anyone says yes. I would actually, hardly anyone. So how do you change? Wait, wait, so, so, so I just, how, how, now what happened? I'll tell you what I think happened. About 10, it has to do with our deeper problems, both in Israel and in the community. About 10, 15 years ago, we realized that the Israel thing is becoming divisive and radioactive. So many rabbis tell me they cannot bring interesting speakers because if anyone has an interesting opinion, he immediately loses the donors on the other side and that side. So we, the whole, the Israel became like, so we took a decision. Not that the elders of Zion met some, but somewhere we took a the, the, We took the strategy that you recommend. We said we'll stop, stop talking about the trouble. We'll talk about Startup Nation and the Tel Aviv clubs. Israel is a high-tech party. And how many Israeli inventions in each cell phone and each iPhone and all that. Which is great and true and remarkable and amazing. What happens? The result is we did not give our young concepts to deal with the assault they face. But, uh, we, we never gave them, not the information, not the concept, not the deep feeling about the... But what are the and concepts? they are so... so you're, you're giving, no, I've heard... Uh, you're you're just, giving diagnosis. Uh, I want to hear prescription. Okay. I'm sorry to... to subscription? Yeah, I want... You, you're I think, have to be... When I said... To, what I, are the concepts that you want? The subscription is to the journal. Yeah, What's yeah, the yeah, prescription? Yeah. Prescription. <laughs> I... What's the I, answer? I, I really think that we have to turn the tables on our enemies. We are right now in a situation, first of all, I think we have to, to, to understand, and I said if I was Israel's prime, prime minister, if I was Netanyahu, I'd say we have Iran up there and we have young American Jews there. It's the most challenging and important and dramatic challenge. I think it's the most important. By the way, it goes with the challenge with the Israeli youngsters. I, it's not as dramatic in Israel, because in Israel you don't have to choose to be a Jew. You are, you are a Jew and active Jew by, by default. The young American Jews have to take the choice every day. We have to change, we have to let them combine their values with Israel. We, no. the, the, the kind of tension that they feel, because what, what is this young generation into? If they're into human rights, Israel is perceived as a human rights violator. They're into universal values, Israel and, the, and their community are perceived as tribal. They oppose any, any they are really naive. They so oppose any use of force, on? which but, I'm worried but, about. But what do you say that turns them on? You're still giving me the problem. I, I actually want to hear... think my experience, yeah. first of all, begin we'll to be sincere with them. Don't patronize them. Don't censor them. Listen to them. Have a sincere dialogue with them. Respect them. And then, when you deal with Israel's problems as well, if you say you have a problem with Israel's occupation, so to speak, go be active in whatever organization. Be involved with whatever Israel you can align with. So if you're conservative, go for conservative Israel. You're liberal, find your liberal Israel. Go feel that Israel is part of your life, that it's relevant, and you can do and talk about it freely. Don't put these kids in a kind of, 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 of situation where they are exposed to all this venom, which is, I, I'm very worried about it. It's very sophisticated, very dangerous. And we say, well, there isn't a problem, you know? No problems at all. So I think that this new way of loving Israel by, while willing to be critical, while being realistic, while dealing with it not in this, you know, I, I, I tell people, loving a top model, lo it's not, a, you know, it's easy. Loving a woman or a man who has wrinkles and problems, that's love, that's love. So admitting, we, are, we, don't, we don't have to say that we, we are no angels. We are definitely no demons. I think we are humans. I think we are remarkable humans. I think if we, if we tell, tell the Israel tale as a remarkable human tale that the youngsters can, can identify with, then we begin to bring them in. Look, I, just one last sentence. I had so many experiences 
dozens, if not hundreds, of young students who came to me after I spoke and said to me, you know, it's the first time I'm proud to be a Jew. It's the first time I feel Israel is relevant. I had hundreds of experiences like that. So there is hunger out there. We, it's not lost. I think we'll face a critical decade. We still have power, wealth, talent, commitment in the older generation, but we have to look, to be sincere about the, the generation gap. People 70 and beyond have the Holocaust as a context and they're religiously committed to Israel. People over 50 have pre-67 Israel, already been Canaan and Exodus in their mind, and they, are, they can complain they are, people under 30 are in a different world. They are not lost at all, there is hope there, but we must find an inventive, creative way to deal with that challenge. We cannot ignore it. Fred, how would you speak to the Israel critics? Um, look, I think Ari is making a point that is very profound um, and interesting and thoughtful, but basically wrong. <laughs> um, the more you butter up, the more you're in trouble. <laughs> no, I mean, what he's saying is, I mean, it's, 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 it's elegant and it's, and it's um, in many ways very convincing. But uh, I happen to think, uh, you know, let me, let me tell you a story. When I was growing up, I was growing up in Mexico City, and for a variety of reasons, my family would drive up to McAllen, Texas every year, uh, every six months for it was a complicated reason. And um, I remember McAllen, Texas as the greatest place in the world. <laughs> Just a miracle. Now, I've, I haven't been back since I was about seven years old. Um, and I imagine if I went to McAllen now, I'd go, what do I remember? I'll tell you what I remember. I remember that you could turn on the tap and you could drink the water. I remember that you went to the movie theater and you didn't have to listen to political propaganda at the beginning and the air conditioning worked, and once you were out of the first movie, you could go and slip into the second movie if you were, uh, if you were, if you were clever. I remember that when you went to cheap restaurants, you didn't have to think that you were gonna come, come out with an incredible uh, stomach, uh, stomach ailment. These small things, which all Americans take for granted, but which make this country amazing. Because a country that just has basic hygiene for 317 million people is amazing. When you start thinking about what this country does on a regular basis unthinkingly, it's amazing. I want to say Israel is amazing. Israel is fantastic. Israel is the most astonishing country in the world. And that point has to be brought in again and again. Israel is the Bar Raffaeli of nations, bar none, okay? It makes the most attractive women. It makes the smartest tech, uh, tech entrepreneurs. It creates miracles from next to nothing. It has more companies on NASDAQ than all of Europe, okay? Seven million Jews in this desert with no, well now they have natural resources. It took them 60 years to find it, okay? And yet they do this and they defend themselves and they do this in the face of nonstop barbarity from their enemies who are just down the road. It's in incredible. I don't think you're gonna sell Israel on the wrinkled woman hypothesis or the wrinkled guy hypothesis. You're gonna sell young people on Israel by saying, believe it or not, this country is incredible. And I'm gonna show you why. And by the way, the arguments against it vanish in the presence of thought. They vanish in the presence of thought. It's, if Israel is so evil, okay, ah, Israel is committing genocide in Gaza. If, if that's the case, why are there Gazans? How can you tell me that Gaza is densely populated and yet Israel is committing genocide against it? Please explain the logic. If Israel is killing so many Palestinians, why are there so many Palestinians? Israel has nuclear weapons. Israel has nuclear weapons. If Israel is as evil as, as its enemies claim, I mean, Saddam Hussein didn't hesitate to, to, to murder everyone in Halabja. Why has there been no Israeli Halabja? So where does this so, wait, but, but so, so, so this, this Look, the arguments against the sort of far left, all this genocide, apartheid, or so on, those are easy arguments to handle. This is the complicated thing. This is the challenge, okay? There are three kinds of nations in the world, people think. There are great powers, there are middle powers, and there are small powers. Not so. There are great powers, there are middle powers, there are small powers, and there are boutique nations. Switzerland is a boutique. Does anyone here not associate Switzerland with excellence? If you have a nice watch, it's made in Switzerland. Banking. Excellent, Switzerland. Everything in Switzerland is clean, tidy, fantastic. Little country that you associate with terrific things. Singapore, it's terrific. Little city-state has nothing, and, and yet what, it's... What, and, yet, and, and what do you say to a young, young 
man, or by the way, it doesn't have to be a young man, man or woman, comes to say, you know, but you have this church and state problem and my Jewish congregation is not recognized by your state. I mean, if you just, if Israel is just so perfect and everything is so wondrous, there are some problems there. You can, I think Israel, I, I, I say Israel is a miracle. I think it's remarkable. But if you do not acknowledge that there are some problems, that it's a real entity, if you just keep it as some sort of postcard, you, you know, people won't listen to you. You won't get to them. You, with all the, the selling, and, and we try that. This is basically what we've tried for, for, for a decade, if not more. And it's not working. It's not working. There is a major, major problem out there. So, so let's, I, now again, I'm totally with you on, on the boutique nation. I, I think I cannot express my, my admiration for, for, for my country. And, 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 and be, I, I, I can go on for 20 minutes because of the circumstances, the, the, the history, the, the, w wherever I go, I, I make a point of talking, especially about Israel of the 50s, that was so miraculous in coming out of death and so on. And I say Israel is very much, the people are still the same. The politics is different. But the people are so remarkable in every way. But there are, if, if you do not allow, if you're not willing to deal with the legitimate concerns, either because of, of occupation and settlement, or because of church of state, or just because of, of, of problem, what do you do with these guys that burnt a 16-year-old? You say Israel is, is wonderful? No. Israel has no, but problems. You, but you, you, have, you, have to de you have to deal with the problems. And if you tell them, Let's, Israel is remarkable. It has problems. Let's work together on, on solving the problems. Then you get them. If you just tell them, you know, it's, 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 it's Ari ben Kanan, you know, they don't buy it. Look, um, probably if you took a poll of men and asked if you could genetically engineer the opposite sex to have a tail like a cat, we'd say yes, right? But we don't because we're, hu we're, we're human beings. What we do say is that when those murders killed that Palestinian boy, the difference and the essential difference is that Israelis were revolted. And yes, in every society, there are thugs and extremists and fools, okay? But Israel was revolted. The entire political establishment rose up to express its revulsion. And there is a fundamental difference between a society that, re that revolts at its worst elements and, a so and societies that celebrate the worst elements. You have to, look, I'm not saying, don't, don't say that Israel is a nation of angels, because obviously it's not, and that's the point I, I, I made, I, I made from, the, from a podium. But talk about it normatively. People keep saying, well, you know, Israel's a Jewish state, and so therefore it, it's, it, it, it excludes you know, other religions, which is not true. But you know, please remind them, say, excuse me, who is the head of state in England? Uh, Queen Elizabeth. Who is the head of the Church of England? Uh, Queen Elizabeth. In Denmark, the most liberal state in the world, you have to pay a tax to the Danish church. To this, I do this to all this the day, just spe these day. specific lines, I do all the time. But they listen to me, and you know, they listen to me because I also allow them to express their concerns. I mean, we, you, um, all these examples, Israel is the fact that we are a democracy in that region and with our history is, is, is wondrous. And, and we are, as I keep saying, you know, I, I didn't have the time to talk about it. You know, wherever I speak about the robust, the, the great success of Zionism is this amazing, robust, free society. Nothing like it. It's, I think it's the world's eighth wonder. But again, you have, if, if, if it's, you, you just, you, you censor the ability to deal with the problems, you lose your credibility. You just lose your credibility. And, and in order, when I say, and, and to say what I think is needed. I want to hear I your elevator pitch. I I, I'll, your, I'll say in a sentence. Because I'll say in a sentence. Wrinkle, oh, on, I'll say, on the one hand, I'm all for, and, and I really, I try to bring wherever I can, you know, no personal attacks, no internal divisions, and you know, Avat Israel and Tikkun Israel. I think these are the things that we need to do. But I do think that in order to be potent again, the way we were in the past, what we, we are losing, we need a creative, renewed, liberal Zionism. We need to go to convince the people out there that we are consist the ones consistent with democracy, with liberalism, and, 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 and then when we tell our story, which is a remarkable story, then it gets the right context. And I think this kind of approach is the one that would lead us to, to real hope. 
listen, um, I agree with what, for once. Ah. You know, with no compliments, that means he really agrees. <laughs> this is, uh, um, I agree with it, but let's remember what, what liberal Zionism has to be. And that's a Zionism that doesn't simply fall into the morass of self-criticism as, by its own sake, ipso facto, a virtuous exercise. Self-criticism is a perfectly valid thing to do. Um, and I always love this argument. Uh, I'll, I'll play on your, on your paper. Everyone says, you know, look at Haaretz. Look at what some of your colleagues are writing about Israel all the time, Amir Haas and all these people, right? Okay, doesn't that just show that Israel is, you know, a state that's capable of self-criticism? Yes, it does, it does, wonderful, it's fantastic. But it also provides, it also provides the vocabulary and the discourse and above all, the license for the enemies of the state to defame it, and that's dangerous. But, but that's exactly, I just wanna, that's exactly my argument with the left, whether in Israel or here. I mean, the inability of, of, of certain elements of the left in my country and in this country to see the positive and the glorious about Israel, their inability, as I said, to deal with third world evil or Palestinian evil, that's their, that's their malaise. But there is the malaise on the other side, which is, it's just really to, to, to gloss it over, to gloss it over. And right now, we are faced with this terrible attack. Now, look, we are very lucky with all this tragedy that's happening. We are very lucky that it happened now during campus break. If this would have happened either in April or in October, my assessment, I hope that I'm wrong, is that the campuses would have been ablaze. I was the one helping, I was helping the people in, in, in UCLA defeat the BDS, the BDS motion. It was seven to five. I bet you that if it would be now, it'll be seven to five at least the other way. Then it gets into the front page of the New York Times, not the Wall Street Journal, and then it begins to get, not, then it begins to get into boardrooms. So we cannot let our love make us blind. The new danger is, is there. That's a danger. And it's only if we go back to what Herzl had and Chaim Weizmann had and Ben-Gurion had, which was being so passionate, so sometimes aggressive, so sophisticated, in, if need, cunning, but at the same time knowing that we must for our own selves and for the world and for our young people, we must capture the moral high ground. Without that, we are a small, lonely people that will be endangered. The moral high ground for us is not only needed for our values and our identity, it's a question of our national security, and it's the question of the future of your community and our community. We must go back there. Uh, look, the moral high ground is marvelous. We have it. We have it whether uh, Berkeley student government think, uh, thinks we have it or not. We have it whether uh, uh, the French government thinks we have it or not. We don't have to worry for ourselves. The only moral high ground that matters is in our own hearts, okay? What we actually need is the high ground. Before we can talk about, you know, Israel is now a country that is constantly hampered, if not crippled, with this concept that we need international legitimacy. Doesn't it tell you something that at this moment, when the sirens are going off, when Israel is being rocketed by this fascistic organization, okay, that we feel that there's a question about international legitimacy. There is no question about it. It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it, and this, it this, was this, it this, was, this, this, this It is, was tried in Iraq. This is, it, the attempt to go without international legitimacy which was tried in Iraq and we saw what happened. Let me tell Let's you. Let's learn from the lessons. Let me tell you what happened in Iraq, okay, in one sentence, okay, or two sentences. The reason we should have gone into Iraq is to make an example of Saddam Hussein. The reason we screwed up in Iraq is because we tried to make Iraq exemplary. There is a difference for, between being a world policeman and being a world priest. And Bush's great mistake is that he started out thinking he wanted to be the world's policeman and to say, we will not accept rogue bastards like Saddam Hussein flouting international norms for years and years and years on end. And then we decided we're going to evangelize and turn this country into Switzerland. That was, that was the essential mistake of Iraq, made, made extremely simple, but that's, you know, uh, that's, uh, that's the basic point. And Israel, by the way, don't ask for the world's love. 
ask for the world's respect. My dearest, my, my deepest fear, my deepest fear right now is that Israel will agree to a ceasefire prematurely. It will give Hamas a propaganda victory. The tunnels will remain in place. The dangers will remain in place. Israel will not get conciliation either from its enemies or from other countries. It will get more problems. Someone once pointed out that Israel defied the West in 1967. Defied the West. LBJ said, you will not be alone unless you go it alone. Israel went it alone. And after that, Israel came out more popular. In 1973, Golda did not defy the West. Israel had more problems. In 1991, uh, Shamir did exactly what Bush wanted of him. Exactly. What was the result? It was more pressure. So Israel finds this interesting thing, which is that when it acts in its own self-interest and when it is successful, it emerges with sipuk, with, with respect. And that's- Do you, and remember, that, do you remember the Lebanon war? And, and unfortunately, we're gonna have to, um, so we, we, have, we have to finish this, but this is actually a good point to, to stop because this conversation in some ways doesn't end. And you know, there's an expression you've all heard, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Nuh uh <laughs> We have to take this and we have to take it home. We I need did. you to continue this conversation. We need you to learn from these extraordinary minds about the things they've touched on. They've touched on the nature of the West. They've touched on the challenges to America today. They've touched on the challenges to Israel. They've touched on the challenges to us as a Jewish community. They've touched on the challenges to us as a Hadassah community. Keep the conversation going. That's what I've learned from them, and I want to thank the two of you for an extraordinary conversation. And a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. I guess they were happy. Sorry, Gil, you didn't have that much to do. <laughs> okay. Wait, wait. Well done. Really good. Sorry, we have a vote. No? All right. My job is to I guess it's fair to say wow. Okay. I want to thank them for a very lively and productive and very thoughtful debate. I was worried for a while that you were agreeing with each other just a little too much. That wasn't the plan. Okay. But it. Let's be serious again for a minute. In Adasa, we have over 330,000 members, donors and supporters, and we all call ourselves Zionists, even though that word might mean different things to different people. But we are committed to a big tent, and we welcome women no matter what their politics, or no matter what their ideology, or no matter what their level of observance is. Because we and the generations before us are committed to practical Zionism. And we've helped build the state of Israel, and we will continue to support and build the state for as long as we are able. We thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Gil.